that sounds good. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. We're exactly at 2 p.m., so we're ready to start. Call the meeting to order. This is um, the inaugural, inaugural meeting of the Delta Conveyance Design and Construction Joint Powers Authority. Um, we'll start, of course, with the Pledge of Allegiance, if you'll all join us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we'll just have a roll call. Uh, Ms. Uh, Linda Stradley will conduct it. Sure. President Estamera? Here. Vice President Atwater? Here. Director Palmer? Here. Director Bloy? Here. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us in this historical inaugural meeting of the DCA. The DCA formation agreement calls for the creation of this joint powers agreement. The, internet, the intent, and uh, as will be considered by this board today, is to enter into a joint exercise of powers agreement with the California Department of Water Resources to design and construct the California water fix in partnership and with oversight from DWR. As contemplated by the DCA formation agreement, the entity will design and construct California water fix and deliver the completed project to DWR for ownership and operation. This partnership, if approved, will allow interagency coordination and con cons consultant expertise to deliver the California water fix on time and on budget. The DCA formation agreement allows for this entity to be formed without all possible future members joining initially. As such, uh, we have the requisite members and directors to begin conducting business. At this time, we will hear from members of the public regarding issues uh, that are within the authority's jurisdiction. We ask you to complete a speaker card uh, and limit your comments to three minutes. I have some speaker cards already, uh, and I'm going to be calling folks uh, according to how I got the cards. We've also, I should for the record, show that we've, we've got, um, I physically have nine letters in front of me uh, that we've received uh, that will be made part of the record, and uh, also those letters that uh, might come in will also become part of the record. So I'll just go right away to, uh, to the cards. Um, and please forgive me, uh, it's not necessarily my pronunciation, it's your handwriting. So the, folk, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the folks after this group should remember that. Uh, Mr. Tim Strosshammer. Stros See, there's a good, I'm sorry, we have a microphone right here. So uh, please join uh, Tim right after that, I'll call the next couple people. Members of the DCA board, I'm Tim Strochane, policy analyst with Restore the Delta. Today is the first day that we hope you will come to Rue attempting to design and construct the most destruct destructive water project in California history, the California Water Fix Delta Tunnels project. The DCA is off to a start we could have predicted. Your project has a regional scale of effects Yet you failed completely to notify the affected public in the Delta region that you, are meeting, that you are meeting here today. Restore the Delta let its members know through our usual email, website, and social media channels. You're welcome. I personally and professionally oppose the project. In my work with the California Environmental Water Caucus, and more recently with Restore the Delta, I have for years evaluated the project carefully anticipating that it would have environmental, that 
anticipating that the water fix project would have its day in court. Water fix proponents have insisted throughout the process since July 2012 when Governor Jerry Brown announced the tunnels project that it would have environmental benefits in the Delta estuary. Members of the authority here likely hope that Section 437 of the House Interior Appropriations Bill passes to create an end run around judicial review for the tunnels project. If the project is so beneficial as you and your allies claim, why would such a detrimental rider be needed from Congress? Why do you fear that submitting the project to judi judicial review that would otherwise be inevitable? At Restore the Delta, we intend to continue our role of getting the word out about the tunnels project to the public. <clears throat> but it is a responsibility also required of you under the Brown Act as a public governmental body. Please shoulder it if you hope to win the pub Delta public's hearts and minds for this project. Whether you shoulder that civic responsibility or not, we intend to make your tenure with the DCA as hellish as we can, whether we can sue the project or not. Thank you for considering my opinion on this vital matter for the Delta. Thank you, Mr. Strong. Uh, the Honorable Diane Burgess. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Supervisor. Good afternoon. My name is Diane Burgess. I'm a county supervisor from Contra Costa County and a member of the Dow Delta County Coalition. And all five counties are represented. And we are very disappointed in how this meeting was set up. Some have called it a, a diabolical plan to get this started the way it has. Some have called it bold and presumptive. You know, the thing is, is I've worked with children on the Delta, and we in the Delta love our Delta. It is fragile, and it is sensitive, and the project that you're working on is going to damage it. I've worked with kids, and they, they say, why did they do that? And I say, because they didn't know. You know. You know this is going to be damaging. The Delta is a unique place. It's the largest estuary west of the Mississippi River, home to many historical legacy communities and towns, a thriving agricultural community, diverse geography, and many natural resources. The Delta supports 5.2 billion annual agricultural industry and a $750 million recreational economy. The transportation infrastructure, which is mostly two-lane levee roads, is a vital to our local and statewide economies and for the safety and welfare of those that live in and near the Delta. Unfortunately, the ongoing water fix debate is obstructing more holistic conversations about much needed water solutions for California. Over a decade has passed since the tunnels were proposed and during this time we could have been building projects that would address statewide water needs. The San Joaquin Delta's valuable and irreplaceable resources warrant long-term protections and any future water management or land use policy changes should not and cannot contribute to the diminishment and destruction of the Delta. Thank you, Supervisor Burgess. Uh, next, uh, the Honorable Don Natoli. Good afternoon, Mr. Supervisor. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the authority. Uh, I'm, uh, um, I'm pleased to be here in the sense that I'm pleased to be able to at least address you about an issue that we believe very strongly in, and I want to just say that uh, as much as you may celebrate today's uh, historical moment, um, we um, uh, take some strong disagreement uh, with the approach. Um, we believe that it adds tremendous insult to injury uh, by the formation of an authority that uh, basically will march into the Delta, pat us all on the head and tell us it's going to be all right because when it's all done, it's going to be good for California. And to be clear, much of the project construction, if not all the project construction, is going to occur in our communities, the Delta communities. And to know that ground zero is in the counties that we represent uh, and both for both construction and the long-term impacts associated with the California water fix. Many of these communities, I would remind you, were settled around the time of the gold rush era. And in some cases, we have uh, seven and eight generation families who make their lives and their homes and have for generations farmed and been part of that fabric of that community. 
If you'll allow me just a moment to portray a picture of anticipated project impacts, and you can go to the EIR if you want to confirm it, but imagine hundreds upon hundreds of additional truck trips per day on rural roads throughout the River Delta. And imagine, too, the snarling traffic crawling through Delta towns dotted with modest homes, small businesses, schools, parks, libraries, churches, and other important assets and amenities, not unlike the communities that you all hail from. And along with the traffic snarl, imagine the roar and rumble of the big rigs, barges clogging the river, and 30 million cubic guards over the life of the project basically strewn throughout the countryside on thousands of acres in a rural part of the Delta. And finally, you can add to what I've just described, the frustration, the inconvenience, and the safety impacts of all the boring, drilling, augering, transporting, <coughs> moving, dewatering, relocating, testing, collecting, sampling, pumping, exploring, constructing, deconstructing, demolishing, burrowing, and digging, and you get the picture. And what that means, that means it's going to disrupt, interrupt, destroy, and what I truly believe, and I've said this before in public settings, will forever change daily life in the historic Delta communities and the communities that we represent. Quiet rural, rural farming towns will be transformed into gigantic construction zones. You've got a picture, this is a miniature scale I get of the boring machine because it's going to be 40 foot in diameter. More akin to an industrial complex than a tranquil country setting. Impacts of these prolonged and intense activities, sometimes seven days a week, 24 hours a day, for years and years, will undoubtedly affect the quality of life and daily activities of these rural farming communities. It will likely displace people from their homes, creating economic uncertainty for small businesses, for farmers, and agritourism. It will affect the recreational, fishing, boating, and ecotourism activities along hundreds of miles of waterways in rural towns and in the Stone Lakes National Wildlife Refuge. My point is, this project is wrong-headed, it's misguided, and we believe that the representation from the local governments has been silenced uh, in, on many occasions, and today is another confirmation of that. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. Uh, Supervisor Oscar Villegas. Good afternoon, Mr. Supervisor. Good afternoon, thank and you. thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing us to speak a little bit here. And so I just start with saying simply that <clears throat> in statute, it's very clear, counties such as ours, the five of us that are here represented today, are subdivisions of the state. That essentially means that we have to be a part of the conversation, certainly what California is doing relative to its water and water fixing. We are a subdivision of the state. The counties represent the people at the closest level. So we have to be invited to the big kids table and to date we have not been. We're also very concerned about the $17 million price tag that's been placed on this. We know that once that $17 million is reached, it's going to go beyond that. And then what, right? There's only so much capacity for ratepayers to absorb their willingness to pay for a project that we know is inadequately underfunded to date. We know that that's the case. We think that once you take that $17 billion off of the table and they've been spent, you no longer have the capacity to go back to ratepayers to say, and here are some other things that we need to do that are more effective, that are more efficient, and that are more, more for friendly to the environment. So we're very concerned on multiple levels. Levels. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Supervisor. <coughs> Supervisor uh, Chuck Wynn. Good afternoon, Mr. Supervisor. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. Uh, let me just uh, digress a moment uh, in regards to the overall global picture that, that my fellow supervisors have from the Delta counties. Uh, for example, in, in, in regards to this particular project, there, there's two things, and I'll only mention these things in, in regards to the negative part of it. The, uh, the Twin Tunnels does not generate any more water, and it doesn't provide any flood protection, which obviously those who live in the valley, both Sacramento, San Joaquin Valley, and other areas are very concerned about in the future, especially by the 17 winter uh, atmospheric forms that we had, storms we had. So having said that, I would also say that, you know, California is not in a, in a situation where we lack water. We're in a situation where we lack infrastructure. I'll give you an example. In, in California, from the north to the south end of the state, we have anywhere from 150 million to 300 million acre feet of rain each year. In 17, just in the four months, those particular atmospheric rivers or storms, uh, we flushed through San Joaquin County 32.6 million acre feet of water, which had no benefit to the environment, had no benefit to agriculture, had no benefit to municipalities. And the reason why that, went, that happened is because we had no storage capacity in those particular areas or we didn't have the capacity farther south because all the reservoirs south of us, even Southern California, were full. 
So if we had that opportunity to take that water and manage it more productively, we would certainly be able to deal with the droughts that we'll have in the future, certainly to manage the floods that we've experienced in the past. And more importantly, the projects, and, and I can tell you that, for example, there's seven projects. There's, there's four new projects and three existing projects that would be raised, basically the dams that currently exist. And that would generate over five million acre feet of storage. Now, we ship less than five million acre feet a year to Southern California and the Central Valley. So by virtue of that, the, the 30 plus million acre feet, we, if we had those in place, we would have the opportunity to save some of that water for future use. The other part of it is in regards to meeting with uh, entities, and, and by the way, this particular group, we met from uh, uh, San Diego to, uh, to uh, Yuba County and 25 different counties, talked to them about their various projects. We met with Santa Clara Valley uh, Authority in regards to some of their projects that they have online. And the reason I bring that up is because why would we want to spend, and as, as Supervisor Viega said, it's not $17 billion. It's going to be, in fact, estimated back in 2013 by the San Jose Mercury News. Probably at least $60 billion, and the way the high-speed rail is going from $6 billion to now over $10 billion, and probably $100 billion if they were built, which they probably won't. Plus, on top of that, they don't have all the right-of-way purchase. They only have 70%, which means to go imminent domain, which may happen with this body. It, it's wrought, fraught with litigation. So my point is, in talking to all these various agencies, there are a variety of projects. Those particular projects with the, uh, with the 5 million acre feet storage only cost $11 billion. I realize mega projects always go over budget and over time, but so will the twin tunnels. And I would rather see those projects built throughout the state for local jobs, local economy, and local control as opposed to putting all that money into one particular project which has no benefit for the rest of the state. We have a chance for a world-class water system. This is not the opportunity we want to pursue. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Wynn. Uh, <clears throat> the Honorable uh, Skip Thompson. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Commissioners. Um, I'm uh, not only County Supervisor for Solano County, also I'm Chair of the Delta Protection Commission, and a member of the Delta Stewardship Council, which is a statewide council dealing with uh, the uh, conveyance ordinance operation and a number of other things. Um, this decade-long focus on tunnels really ignores the cost-benefit of many other projects that could be considered. I, I have to tell you that you're going down the wrong tunnel. The Delta Reform Act of 2009 established COECO goals, mandated a policy to re reduce reliance on water exports, from the Delta and investment in alternative water supplies. The proposed water fix will not reduce Delta diversions and addresses only one of the co-equal goals. There are many alternative projects being proposed throughout the state which would unite California. My colleagues and I have been from San Diego to the North Coast talking to editorial boards, talking to a number of the citizens here in, in California to talk about why this is a bad project. And there are other projects that will really unite California from north to south. Uh, local projects add water to the system, promote local jobs and contr uh, local control. Bond money could instead go to less controversial projects that add water to the system and not cause further devastation to the Delta. Expanding the project with a JP at this point in time is grossly inappropriate. Where it may take, make the governor happy, it is bad public policy to acquire land, design and construct the proposed project before it is fully permitted, before environmental impacts identified. In addition, many lawsuits are pending and bonds have not been uh, validated yet. <clears throat> and you know, I think to put it in layman's terms, you don't build a house before you get the permit. That's what we're doing here. You need to go through the permitting process and the bond validation process before you embark on this crazy project. For many years, most of the planning for the fix has occurred behind closed doors. Where I suppose that this meeting is the first good step, it really doesn't go far enough. My colleagues talked about local government being involved. There are four million people that are gonna be directly uh, impacted, and yet the state, the governor and his administration have not made one conscious effort to reach out to us to say, we need to have you included. We can be part of the solution, but if we're not, we can be really part of the problem. So I guess the question that my colleagues and I would like to ask this board is, how are you gonna work with local government? How are you gonna work with the community to make sure their issues are addressed 
and that we are not harmed by the project. And so, uh, you know, I, I would just ask you to reconsider what I think is a full-hearted attempt right now. Let's get all the permits and the bond in, in line, and then you can embark on a project if you really feel in your heart it's the right project. So from the Delta Counties Coalition, we appreciate uh, this time and uh, wish you best in your decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Thompson. I have next, next uh, Ms. Barbara Barragan Parilla. Good afternoon, Barbara Berrigan Perea with Restore the Delta. Good afternoon. I um, have a few questions um, for the uh, board here for the JPA. Uh, Mr. Arkawa, Director Keegan, uh, President Estramera, I have sat through countless meetings and I have heard time and time again from you or from staff addressing <coughs> you how the Delta tunnels are going to save our fisheries in the Delta for years. If this project is so environmentally reliable, then why is Congressman Kelvert leading the charge with federal legislation right now to bypass all state and federal laws in terms of environmental protect protections for the construction of this project? Why is he leading the charge to bypass due process? if this project can really stand up to environmental scrutiny. There wouldn't be an end run around you being held accountable by the public if this project really did stand up to true environmental scrutiny. We've asked, we've been to every hearing, we've supplied thousands of pages of comments that document the problems with this project. And you assured people, your ratepayers, your fellow members on your boards of directors, that you were pursuing a project that was environmentally sound and that was going to protect the Delta. We're not even out the gate. You do not have permits. You have documents today to start moving along with eminent domain work in your packets, but there's an end run around the legislation, uh, with this legislation. If you believe the project can stand up to that test, you would not want to be part of a process that would eliminate due process and environmental protection. There would be no crickets from your water districts, because that's all we're hearing is crickets. The silence is deafening. And we're hearing nothing from Governor Brown. If this is truly an environmental project, do the right thing and have the project stand up to the state and federal laws that are in place. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any other cards right now, so uh, we'll continue the meeting. We'll go right to uh, item number five. Uh, at this time, uh, I would like to formally acknowledge that I received the appropriate documentation from rep representative agencies to indicate the following directors and alternate directors. First, Tony Estramera, myself, director and president from Santa Clara Valley Water District. I'll just take a minute and ask the other uh, members to uh, take a minute just to describe maybe uh, your background and or um, <coughs> the uh, organizations that you represent just for the benefit of the public. Um, I uh, represent about 300,000 people in Santa Clara County, Silicon Valley, uh, from part of downtown and the east side of uh, San Jose. Uh, all of my district is within the city of San Jose. It's part of the poorest sections of town. Uh, this is my 23rd year of service on, that, on our board. Um, and. Um, I uh, have another year on my term, uh, and we do have term limits on our board, uh, so some of us will, will serve another term, others will serve less. Um, we, are a, uh, we are both a flood control agency and a water supply agency. We um, operate 10 dams and reservoirs, three water treatment plants. Um, we, have, uh, we are in charge of um, 
287 streams and ponds. Um, and I'm sure that uh, I'll leave some for Barbara to describe. My alternate is uh, Barbara Keegan. Ms. Keegan? Uh, thank you very much, President Estramera, um, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, I represent District 2, Santa Clara Valley Water District. It is the uh, central part of the county, and geographically it's the smallest because it's the most intense population. Um, I think that um, uh, President Estramera gave a very good overview of our organization and what we what we do. In terms of my professional background, I'm a civil engineer. I have a bachelor's and master's degree in engineering. And I am very happy to be an alternate director here, and I look forward to the process as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Atwater. I'm the, the vice chair of, of the JPA. Um, I'm a board member at the Metropolitan Water District, uh, but elected at our member agency, the Foothill Municipal Water District, which was formed in 1952 uh, in the area of Pasadena and Glendale, for those of you in Northern California. Um, uh, of course, Pasadena was the first adjudicated basin in, in California, and, and all our groundwater in our area is adjudicated. And the reason why we joined uh, through a vote of the, of the public was to, of course, receive imported water from the Colorado River, and, and secondly, in the 1960s with uh, the State Water Project. Uh, I began working with Santa Clara Valley Water District when I professionally worked at the Bureau of Reclamation back in the 1980s when they uh, went through the, the long, arduous process of completing the San Felipe Project to get CVP water from San Luis Reservoir and how critical that was to the growth of Santa Clara County. And uh, at that time, I had something similar to what Jill Durig is doing it. I was the interim executive director on the formation of the California Urban Water Agencies where we got Contra Costa and East Bay Mud and Santa Clara working with Metropolitan, City of LA and San Diego. So I have a long history of working collaboratively up and down the state and I would just say that my goal here um, historically is, is to fully evaluate all these uh, programs and, and clearly I um, had a lot of experience with uh, joint powers agencies uh, as one simple short example, uh, the Santa Ana River has had a JPA uh, that's been going on since 1972. And one of the successes of that is that that's the largest developed recycled water supply in North America. And in fact, it's equal to as much recycled water that's used as people like to properly say in Israel. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities here. And I think certainly the Delta Fix is a key part of a statewide solution. I'm always welcome ideas of how to improve upon this. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Director Atwater. I'll move it over to Director Steve Blois. Thank you, President Estramera. I'm Steve Blois. I represent uh, Metropolitan Water District, where I serve on their board as uh, board secretary. Um, I'm appointed to that position from my elective uh, water agency, which is the Cagus Municipal Water District, which serves uh, about 660,000 people in southern Ventura County. Cagus is particularly dependent upon the state water project as our intake is too high to receive Colorado River water. And therefore, all of our imported water comes from the state water project. So this project has always been of particular interest to those of us in Ventura County. Uh, and that's part of my reason for being on this board. Uh, my other reason is my background is as a uh, uh, retired pipeline infrastructure contractor. In my career, uh, mostly in Southern California, I've built pipelines from half an inch diameter to 20 feet in diameter. Um, I know the lingo, I know the jargon, I know what makes a successful project and what doesn't. Uh, my mission and the mission of the DCA is very simple. We are here to modernize and improve the uh, water delivery infrastructure of the state uh, and we're going to do that. I'm going to do my darndest to see that that mission is accomplished. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Director. Uh, Mr. Stephen Arakawa, who's the alternate director. <laughs> Sorry, we were, uh, uh, don't have enough mic. Yeah, we'll pass, pass the mic. Um, good afternoon. My name is Steve Arakawa, and I serve as an alternate on the board, um, uh, staff for Metropolitan Water District. 
Uh, I work on Bay Delta issues. Um, I've worked for Metropolitan for a little over 31 years. And um, my background is in civil engineering. Um, my experience uh, has been including water conservation in our service area, uh, implementing programs on water conservation, uh, recycled water, groundwater treatment, groundwater management, and managing over imported water supplies, both the Colorado River and the State Water Project. Um, in my role now, I'm uh, very much involved in Bay Delta issues, and uh, I look forward to contributing to this effort as an alternate. Um, I've, my whole career, I've, ser I've served uh, in public service, and I look forward to participating in this as a public servant as well. Thank you, Mr. Arcado. Mr. O'Shane Chapman, he's another alternate. Uh, good afternoon. A pleasure to be here. Shane Chapman, uh, Chief Administrative Officer, Assistant General Manager, Metropolitan Water District, uh, currently responsible for human resources, information technology, contracts and procurement, um, real property and environmental planning. So looking forward to working with uh, the DCA and ensuring an appropriate and transparent uh, operation of this entity. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Sarah Palmer, who's the director. Okay, I'm Sarah Palmer. I'm from Zone 7 Water Agency. Uh, we're up in the region uh, east of Sa uh, San Francisco. We serve Dublin, Pleasanton, and Livermore, bits of Sunol. About 240,000 people, a little bit more. And uh, we're a water wholesaler for the most part. We do water wholesale for, um, for Dublin San Ramon Services District, Cal Water, Livermore, uh, Pleasanton. And also, we, uh, we serve directly to several of the wineries. So if you guys enjoy like Winty or, or Con Cannon, any of those wines, uh, we, we give them their water. And um, what, we, what we've got then is, for me personally, I've been on the board for about 12 years now. And my background is I have a PhD in biochemistry. Um, I've taught at, um, at UC Berkeley, at uh, Cal State. At, it was kind of a half degree, will travel type of a thing. I was in uh, cancer research for a few years in mammary cancer research, and um, also medical diagnostics. Um, also taught environmental science for about 20 years, so that's um, been been a passion of mine as well. Uh, my main my main goal really is to see to public health. So public health is one of the things that, that I feel most strongly about that is something that directly applies to this project. Uh, zone 7, in terms of where we are, we like to think of ourselves as Northern California, but in actual fact, we are right on the, um, we're right sucking from the, from the pipeline there. It is, uh, basically we get 80% of our water from the from the state water system so it's very much within our interests to be looking at this project thank you director palmer uh, next uh doug hedrick who's an alternate yes good afternoon doug hedrick i'm the general manager of san bernardino valley municipal water district we're a state water contractor we were the second agency to sign a an agreement with the state of California in 1960 for a supply of water. Uh, my board of directors <coughs> represents uh, 700,000 people in Southern California. It spans seven cities and 13 different um, water agencies. My background is also in civil engineering, but I also have a graduate degree in finance specializing in municipal finance. And uh, I've served uh, in California water for about 30 years and with uh, the San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District for uh, just over 11. Thank you. We'll move right along then to uh, our next item. Um, um, at this time, um, uh, are there any nominations for board secretary? President Destromera, I would like to nominate uh, our colleague Sarah Palmer as secretary of this board. Thank you, director. Is there a second? I'll second it. Great. Motion is second. Um, those motions say aye. Aye. Both say no. Extensions? Great. Welcome aboard, our Secretary. Thank you. Move right along to our next item, C, designate regular meeting. Uh, since uh, we're a new entity, it's necessary that we designate regular meeting locations and times. Uh, staff uh, recommends that this entity meet every third Thursday of each month, beginning at 2 p.m. Uh, here at the Public Library. Um, also, we should consider meeting every two weeks initially instead of monthly. So 
uh, for discussion. I, I believe we have an awful lot to do, especially at the beginning uh, with respect to formation uh, and then later for discussing uh, uh, many policy issues that we will have to address. And so I think um, at least uh, uh, twice a month, uh, either the first and third, second or fourth, uh, might be best. So I'd um, entertain some discussion. President Estramera, if I might yes. explain the staff um, recommendation. At this time, logistically, it would be very difficult to find a location and to find time on the schedules for two meetings a month, I think, for everybody at the table. Um, it, while it might be appropriate as we move forward, I would suggest that it would be premature to set up twice a month meetings at this time. Well, let's see what the, let's see what the directors think and then we can see what we can do. So, what? any discussion? Sure, it's a suggestion. Obviously, I don't know if we want to pull out our calendars and figure out logistics of these alternative meetings because I think we all have really busy schedules. Um, I agree with discussing this, and, I, and certainly if we need to meet more often, I'm open to that. But why don't we, uh, this is the first meeting, uh, make that as a, a suggestion that maybe um, uh, the executive director and the staff can work with the board kind of look at counters. Um, we have one committee already. How do we uh, uh, manage our time more effectively and how do we do this? So what I would suggest is that the, at the June meeting, maybe we can take your suggestion and let's put it on paper so that we all know this logistically is going to work on the calendar for everybody. Yes, sir. Perhaps by Perhaps by putting it off um, for a little bit in terms of decision, we could have a couple of alternatives, and then we could weigh that and see which might work best for people's uh, people's schedules. So, I'm inclined to accede to staff's recommendation. Uh, no sense in having meetings unless there's something to meet about and discuss. I do think it's important that. Uh, we let the public know so that we're as transparent as possible of when we meet uh, and where we meet. Uh, I would suggest that moving forward, maybe as you suggested, at our next meeting we think about maybe clearing some dates and calendars so that at least we get past that hurdle logistically. Uh, but uh, let's let staff get their hands around what we've got a hold of here uh, before we decide to meet twice a month, I think, at this point. Okay, the reason why I raise it, of course, is because if we don't meet, if we meet six weeks from now, that's six weeks that decisions are not made with respect to executive director, recruitment, and so on. Uh, you know, if we need to put out an RFP for positions, if we need to um, put together, a, we have to draft bylaws, we need to talk about committees, it takes time to form those and do the administrative work after that. So that's why I say if we wait six weeks, uh, then six weeks, that's only to get ready to get ready. Uh, so uh, if we wait till the next meeting, and I, I'm okay with that, but if we wait till the next meeting, um, we gotta make sure that you know nobody says, well, we're already too late, okay? <laughs> we're already too late to set meetings. We're already too late to uh, put out an RFP for, a, for, a, for an executive director and so on. So I think it's a two-way street. If we, wait to, if we wait till June, we gotta understand that we're gonna wait a pretty long time before we really do get going. Uh, and so when we get there in June, um, I don't think it'll be productive to discuss in June that we're too far down the line to uh, do certain things that we have to do. So if we want to wait till June to set up meetings and then to initiate some of our procedural stuff like bylaws and so on, then we're going to need to take the time to do that. So if we're all okay waiting till June, then we've got to understand that everything else is going to take time. Could we have some alternatives given to us first, perhaps by the, by the staff to... Uh, maybe do some kind of a polling or something to see how we might be able to fit a meeting sooner into our schedules. Yeah. 
Just sure. I think you, I agree with you that we ought to do exactly what you're outlining. But my only uh, another suggestion, because we can develop these alternatives. But if you'd like to, as, as chair and vice chair, why don't we work with the executive director in the next few weeks to do exactly what uh, Director Sarah just suggested, and that is kind of lay out some alternatives that we can discuss at the at the May excuse me the June 21st board meeting. It's only a you know it's, it's not that far off, and, and and make sure that we can figure out the as a startup the logistics and when to schedule these. Uh, I think. Uh, um, I think we all agree with your goal. It's just uh, how to implement it. Okay, that's fine. Then we'll do that. We'll try our best to um, figure out whether we need a special meeting in between this next June. And then we'll, we'll agree then that uh, the next meeting will be this June meeting unless we do a special meeting then be before that. President Estramer, it's probably appropriate to take a motion to I, set it that yeah, way. Yeah, I was just looking at that, except that. <laughs> I'd, I'd make a motion that our, that we have now notified that the third Thursday of each month uh, at one, at one o'clock, two o'clock, excuse me, I just at forgot. Two o'clock. Two o'clock that we ha hold our, our <coughs> normally scheduled meetings, which uh, under the Brown Act we need to notify. Second that. Okay. There's a motion and second to adopt. I'm uh, sorry, before you go to vote, um, we also need to designate the place of the meeting in the motion. Yes, and I assume we wanted we need to use this. At the public library. The, the, the Sacramento Public Library where we're located today, that'll be the, the official notice as far as again compliance with the Brown Act. Okay. Those with motion then say aye. 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 Both say no. Okay, we'll move right along. If there's any special meetings, we'll set them. Uh, number six, the uh, consent calendar. Uh, there are no items on the consent calendar, so this is our first meeting. Uh, at this time, um, we'll move right along to 7A. Um, if, there are any, if there are any public members that wish to address us on any items uh, under item seven, um, I have no request to address us on any item under number seven. Uh, if that's the case, that's fine. Otherwise, uh, please fill out a card and provide it to the clerk uh, so you can address us on uh, any of the items under seven. So we'll start then. I have no, no request, so I'll move right along to 7A. Um, Mr. Keir from the Met Metropolitan Legal Staff We'll provide the staff report on this item, if there be any. Thank you, President Estimera. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, um, and members of the board. I, I'll be very brief in this report. Um, this is for uh, adopting the CEQA determination as a responsible agency. Um, uh, the Delta Conveyance Design Construction Authority is a public agency and subject to CEQA. Um, it's rather a unique agency in that all of your actions will in essence, flow from the uh, joint exercise of powers agreement um, that you're, will be uh, is on your agenda um, further down today. Um, that joint exercise of powers agreement with the Department of Water Resources, in turn, is focused on uh, assisting in design and construction of the Cal Water Fix. We all know that. Um, the Cal Water Fix uh, project, in turn, was subject of an extensive uh, environmental impact report that was concluded um, last summer when DWR approved the project. Uh, so the action here, first up, is as a responsible agency under CEQA. Uh, and it's the same action that you, as, you know, as your member agencies, took um, in authorizing, uh, well, similar <coughs> action that you took as a member agency um, and as a responsible agency under CEQA when approving your participation in Cal Water Fix. So there is a resolution in your packet um, before you and that was distributed to the public uh, on the website. And the resolution is that the board has considered the lead agency's certified final EIR and addendum in evaluating the, the project's environmental impacts and has determined that its environmental documentation is adequate for use by the authority when making discretionary actions on the project. 
that the board adopts the findings and statement of overriding consideration as prepared and adopted by the department, that the board adopts the mitigation monitoring and reporting plan as prepared and adopted by the department, and as the lead agency that DWR, and noting that as lead agency, the department is ultimately responsible for ensuring that these feasible mitigation measures are implemented. I'd be happy to answer any questions on this. Thank you. Any questions on Mr. Kerr? I make a motion to approve uh, item 7A. So the motion to approve uh, 7A, which is to adopt the sequel determination for actions pursuant to joint exercise of powers agreement with the Department of Water Resources, that the board has reviewed and considered the California Water Fix environmental documentation and adopts the lead agency's findings on this matter. Any further questions or discussions? A second. Second. Motion is second then. Those for motion say aye. 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 Post say no. Item passes unanimously. We'll move right along then to 7B to authorize execution of professional service agreement for interim executive director with management partners and appoint alternate director Shane Chapman as um, the uh, agreement administrator. Uh, Ms. Morris, would you please provide the staff uh, report for this item? Thank you. Uh, this, this would be a contract between management partners and the DCA. The scope of work would be for Jill Durig to perform the interim executive director duties. And they, her, the scope of work will allow her to ensure the orderly and seamless transition of the program from the planning phase to the implementation phase. The key terms are um, that the contract would begin it presumably today if you adopt it uh, through May 16th of 2019 or until um, terminated earlier. Um, the key personnel would be Ms. Durig performing the work. The agreement administrator, as noted by President Estramera, would be Shane Chapman from Metropolitan Water District. It's a contract to not exceed $375,000. It can be terminated uh, with 10 days notice to consultant. The fee schedule is attached to the contract that was provided to the public um, at the table and would be for the hourly billing rate of $250 an hour. And I would just note that Ms. Derg was the has just recently retired as the general manager for Zone 7 Water Agency, has been very familiar with this project and, and very instrumental <coughs> in moving it forward, has a lot of experience in the water world previous to, to her 11 years at Zone 7. Happy to answer any questions. I make a motion to approve of this, and I would just uh, echo the uh, Jill's exceptionally qualified, and we're really thankful that you're willing to take on this heady job for the next couple of years. I really appreciate it and want to acknowledge your expertise. I'll second the motion. We <clears throat> actually were on a different, we're on the one before that. Yeah. Yeah, we're on the item before that, <clears throat> which is uh, with respect to uh, Gene Chapman being the agreement administrator, so I didn't want to mix them up. <coughs> so oh. let's go back to. Uh, I, I think that it's. I was just presenting the agreement for interim executive director services, and it was one um, agenda item with Mr. Shane Chapman administering the agreement. Yes. <coughs> and it's a contract for through management partners. I understand, I understand okay. but the, the motion was to the next item, so I'm trying to straighten out the motion. Oh, I apologize if I'm it correctly. I'm, I'm, it's, again, it's at 7B. Yes. And that's the motion. Yes. And that's my second also. <coughs> All right. We're talking about, um, yeah, 7B is Jean, uh, Shane Chapman as agreement. Um, Administrator, that's correct. Okay, those for the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say no. We're moving right along to C, which is to authorize <coughs> execution of professional service agreement for interim general counsel with Besson Krieger and appoint alternate director. Um, <coughs> Seem to have, I seem to have a B and C that's the same. <laughs> it's 
start some of this thing. President Estramera, if I may, this item, item C, is for the interim general counsel rather than um, the last one, which was for interim executive director. Thank you for approving that. And um, since we can't administer our own contracts, it says that Shane Chapman, who's an alternate director and the assistant general director, uh, assistant general manager for um, Metropolitan, is going to administer those two interim contracts. As with the proposal for executive director, Stephanie has been kind enough to say that she'll agree, and we think this is going to be very good because she's been very active in both the planning phase and we hope that she'll continue to remain involved on some level. So the term sheet is, has also been made available to the public on the last, um, on the table in the entryway. The key personnel will be Stephanie Morris, even though the contract is with Best Best in Krieger. It is, again, a one-year contract starting today through May 16th of 2019, unless terminated earlier. And it's a total not to exceed amount of $425,000. Can I so move? Is there a second? Second. Okay, there's motion and second then. Um, <clears throat> those motions say aye. 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 Opposed say no. <clears throat> we move right along to D, which is the authorized execution of the joint exercise of powers agreement between the Department of Water Resources <clears throat> and the Delta Conveyance Design and Construction Joint Powers Authority. Uh, Ms. Morris, could you please provide us with a staff report? Yes. Many of you have seen this, and it's been part of the public packet and under consideration um, at your individual board uh, meetings, but I did want to just run through some of the key terms briefly and then answer any questions. So the JEPA agreement is two parties. It would be the DCA and DWR executing the agreement. Um, the effective date of the agreement, although if authorized by you today, would be signed today, the effective date would occur at a later point in time because it's a contract with a state agency. It has to go through approval through the department from the department DGS. I, I momentarily forgot general services, so Department of General Services. So it wouldn't be effective today, just to be clear. Um, the scope of the work that is provided for under the DCA and in the JEPA agreement is that the DCA, under the supervision of DWR, would build the conveyance project um, as specified by DWR, and DWR will own and operate the facility as part of the state water project. There's several key terms, so I'm, I'm not going to go through each one, but I did just want to point out um, that the key issues really revolve around the specifications, and those are uh, exhibits that are attached to the JEPA agreement. And there are certain provisions in this agreement that allow only allow for um, changes to be made that are non-material without going back to DWR. So the materiality clauses in this JEP JEPA agreement are important and the two that are sort of the key are if there's a 5%, if there's any changes in the specifications that are cause a 5% increase in budgeted costs or a six, a, a six month or longer delay in, in the timeline for delivering the project, those would be material <laughs> changes that would have to go back to DWR for approval. Um, in addition, I would just note there's a whole section dealing with the permits. The DCA, as the construction agency, would be responsible for um, following and abiding by those permits that are either obtained by DWR or the DCA. In regards to um, land acquisition, DCA does not have authority uh, to use eminent domain. They have authority to, to do voluntary agreements for purchasing necessary property. But DWR remains the entity that would do any, any eminent domain necessary to construct this project. At that point, um, I would just note that there are significant insurance requirements, so that will be one of the items that we will be reporting on that we will need to um, get bids and, and obtain the uh, necessary insurance required under the JPA when it becomes effective. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for staff? Yes. 
Yes, Director Bruce. So I'd like to make a motion that we authorize our board <coughs> president to execu ex execute the joint exercise of powers agreement between the Department of Water Resources and the Delta Conveyance Design and Construction Joint Powers Authority. Is there a second? I second. Thank you. Any questions? Those for the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Abstentions? Passes unanimously. We'll move right along then to E. <clears throat> Authorize the executive director to solicit auditor services for board consideration. Um, is there a report on that? Just a very brief report. Thank you. Uh, this, this motion, we're required under uh, the the DCA formation agreement to hire an auditor as soon as practically possible. That, that auditor should be selected by the board, so this would authorize the executive director to get bids for that auditor and bring them back and present them to you, hopefully at the next board meeting. I'd make a motion to authorize the executive director to uh, uh, bring back a recommendation on auditor services. A second. Second. Does that give you enough time? I'll come back and let you know if it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, those for the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion passes. <clears throat> we'll move right along to authorize the executive director to negotiate and execute an interagency agreement with the Metropolitan Water District to uh, provide treasury and accounting services. Uh, the report very briefly um, this would just as was contemplated in the formation agreement which allows for interagency agreements to pull in the best and the brightest and to be the mm -hmm. most cost effective mm -hmm. this would allow the executive director to negotiate and execute an interagency agreement for both accounting services and Treasury services through uh, mr. Gary bro who is the CFO of Metropolitan Water District and happy to answer any questions Questions? I will make that motion. motion. Is there a second? Okay, second. All right, second. <laughs> <clears throat> Those with motion say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion passes. We'll move right along to authorize the next one is G. Authorize the executive director to negotiate uh, and execute an interagency agreement to provide other services. Very More. briefly, thank you. Um, this again, as I mentioned, the formation agreement and expects that there will be interagency agreements. We will need staffing and sort of an engineering, IT services, things of that nature. So this would be to, to allow the executive director to use um, interagency agreements with uh, member agencies and other state water contractors, also with the Department of Water Resources to begin to pull those resources and pull from the best and the brightest. And so this would allow her to negotiate and execute those interagency agreements. Questions? No, I think it makes sense to utilize all the existing state contractors and DWR for these types of services. So I'd make a motion uh, consistent with that. Is there a second? I'll second it, but I would request that uh, agree with that. With that addition, those for the motion, say aye. 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 <laughs> Both say no. <clears throat> Move right along to H. <clears throat> Authorize um, authority staff to prepare and file all necessary documents related to the formation of a joint powers authority and to take other steps necessary and convenient for the creation of a public agency. Um, Ms. Morris. Thank you. So this would be to, it's a little bit of a catch-all. Um, because we are a new agency, there's several things that we know have to take place. For example, we need to get a federal taxpayer ID number. <coughs> we need to file certain paperwork with the Secretary of State. There may be other things as we are going through the documentation in the next several weeks that we need to do just to get the agency up and formed. So this is a catch-all. Um, to allow for that. In addition to that, uh, if directed by the board, we could begin to look at some of the um, resolutions and documentation that we would need. 
such as uh, bylaws and staff could be again drafting those to bring back to you conflicts of interest codes and things of that nature. Happy to answer any questions. Questions? Want to take a motion? I move that we do that. I'll second. Yeah, I'll second it. Okay. Uh, <coughs> motion to adopt uh, the staff recommendation. Those for motion say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Abstentions? Motion carries. <coughs> and then we're at reports. Um, this will generally be a, a regular item on our agenda. I don't suspect that there'll be much report, much uh, to report, but we'll go to uh, in any case. Uh, so we'll, uh, Ms. Duareg, uh, please provide your report. We actually have a, a few slides Great. to share with you uh, to show you kind of how we got here and where we're hoping to head. Um, there's a, a bit of a program overview that we're going to talk about, uh, the formation, of course, and uh, some planned initial work activities, and then the next steps. We all know, and many of our speakers mentioned, that Water Fix is located primarily in the Delta area. It's um, going to have three intakes in the Sacramento River. It's going to have an intermediate four bay, several tunnels, and then a Clifton Court pumping plant. The budget, uh, and this is in 2017 dollars, so it hasn't been updated in the last few months, but you'll see that the actual tunnel piece is estimated at just under seven billion dollars. The rest is for ancillary needs, whether it's intake construction, utilities and power, but there's a huge contingency in there too because we are still very early in the design. It's a 36 percent contingency to get us up to that almost 17 billion dollars. So um, it's, it's very important to note that. A little bit of background on this organization. We recognized during the planning period that there was going to be a need for some kind of um, an oversight group and in 2011 there was a planning exercise completed um, and it outlined roles, some decision-making processes and some potential reporting that could make this project move forward more smoothly. The design and construction enterprise was established in 2014 as part of DWR and it's been providing oversight management of the planning and environmental impact analysis. DCE is going to gradually transition out now that we've finished the planning phase and we're really entering into the design and construction phase. And um, that's where the DWR Delta Conveyance Office is going to take over and continue to provide oversight, but the DCA will be providing the engineering. And so there's some key concepts. This is a special purpose enterprise, and what that is very important to note is that it's going to sunset when the project gets turned over to DWR. It's a new way for DWR and the public water agencies to work together to assure success. I mean, that's our our common goal, I think, to keep it on time, on budget, and try to do what we can to <coughs> assure that all the environmental improvements and mitigation are done. It's a single point of accountability for the project. It assures, as Steph has mentioned several times, the best in class staffing. And um, it's, it's really, we think it's going to be really good. We're excited about it. So here's the entity relationships for those who like um, a little bit of a layout instead. The Delta Conveyance Office at the top, that's the DWR oversight. The, at the bottom you have the Delta Conveyance Design and Construction Joint Powers Authority or DCA as we've been calling it. Um, to, between the two of them there's going to be a JEPA agreement that you've just approved us entering into. And then the financing is to be provided by a financing JPA. Some of the initial activities you've already taken care of. You've hired an initial um, 
interim executive director and an interim general counsel, but now we have to work on some of the other factors that are on this list, and I won't belabor it and go through it. You all can read, too. So the objectives for the startup team are going to be mobilize the resources necessary to appropriately staff the organization. And I, as I say appropriately staff, that means interim where we need it, more permanent, longer term um, assignments where better appropriate. And it's really to continue the key water fix activities and to initiate um, any new time sensitive work in the quickest manner possible. That's why you hired interim <coughs> staff. Some of the water fix work that is transitioning to the DCA is the program management and the permitting management. There was a lot, there were a lot of comments about the permits. Yes, there are a lot of permits that we're still working on. Permits aren't something that happen overnight. You just don't file it and get your permit as you stand in line and wait. Sometimes it's months or even years, and so these are already all in process. The eventual DCA will be pretty large. This is a very large project, so we anticipate a lot of key roles, whether it's finance and accounting, which we just talked about on the far left, um, some of the communications and outreach, the internal and auditing, again, you talked about this today, program manager. Um, the legal counsel, again, you took care of an interim assignment today. Risk management, the, um, Ms. Morris was talking about some of the insurance um, that we're going to be looking into for this project, and last but hardly least is safety management. So our goal on staffing the DCA is really to get the best in class, and we think that this kind of single purpose organization is going to facilitate that. Uh, it's a single point of accountability. It's a melded team with the best we can find anywhere, whether they're currently in public service and we can bring them on board through uh, interagency agreements or whether they're in private and we bring them on board through consultant agreements. We hope to have all of the key staff that will be working on this co-located in a single location so they can work together. And staffing, again, will come from a variety of locations. But to emphasize once again, this is not a permanent organization. Many of you come from organizations that are 50 or 100 years or 150 years old. This is not. When this project is done, this organization will no longer exist. So what we anticipate doing during the first three months as we're getting some of these startup activities going is to continue to move forward the permitting so we don't drop the ball on that. Uh, to find some office space, to get some of those financial systems in place. So thank you for letting us um, have the authority to do an interagency with MET for some financing assistance. To begin to secure long-term staff from the uh, public water agencies, again, thank you for approving that. And then we had some, um, some institutional days where we talked to the um, various consultants about the projects and then we did some initial requests for uh, qualifications, RFQs, and we got responses back a few months ago for a permanent executive director, for an engineering design manager, for property acquisition services, for a sort of catch-all of surveying, mapping, right-of-way, title services, and last for geotechnical services. Um, the geo these five um, responses have been received but have not been opened. They've been under seal. So we're going to review what we got, see if we can make selections from what we got, and if not, we'll come back and tell you, no, we have to go back out and do an RFQ because none of them were adequate. And um, we'll be making recommendations to you to hire, hopefully, these will be our first five recommendations. And then to award those consulting contracts after board approval, obviously, at some future meeting. First six months continues, um, so the next three months after that, we're talking in quarters here, to establish a fully functioning DCA office. 
um, to develop an overall program management plan. This will be some annual budgets and work plans and schedules to establish overall program controls management um, and, of course, the standard administrative procedures, whether they're HR or procurement or whatever they are, to develop a communications plan for the program, um, some risk assessment, mitigation, and management. This has been something that's been key throughout the planning process. When we talk about this risk management, we're talking largely about reducing risks that might slow down the pro project or program or might add cost to it. So we're trying to come up with ways to make, our, make sure it comes on time and on budget. <coughs> this is a schedule that's almost impossible to read, but the bottom line is that the next three months are going to be very busy and we're going to just get busier and busier as we go forward. We are now switching from the blue, which was the planning piece, to the green, which is what we're starting to do, design and construction organizational things. And then the actual construction we're hoping is the yellow that we'll be moving forward hopefully by the fourth quarter of this year with starting some construction. So any questions? Questions? Yeah, that, I think that's an outstanding presentation, Jill. Uh, obviously, there's a lot to cover with that, and so my suggestion would be um, next month we allocate time to really get into the, the details so that all the members of the board and the public understand that uh, there's what the activities are going to be over in the next three to six months. That would be great. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. And I, I have a lot of help. You know, I can't even tell you how much yeah. goes well, into it. And this is a world-class project. In my experience with joint powers agencies and these big projects, you're doing exactly the right roadmap of how to put together uh, the best-in-class team to get this done in a timely, cost-effective, and uh, you know, overall keep within budget. Thank you. Yeah, I did want to make sure that um, with respect to the executive director, uh, one, that, um, that we have a process that the, the board approves, and two, of course, that the, the board make a decision with respect to who the executive director is going to be. The report isn't very clear about that, so maybe at the next meeting we can talk a little bit more about it and the process that we expect. Of course, yes. Okay, and then the, any further questions? Okay, uh, uh, thank you. Then we'll move on to the, our next report from thank General Counsel. Thank you. Just briefly, um, I'd like to note that this uh, presentation that was provided by uh, Ms. Derg was not provided to the board members before or at this meeting, so we don't have copies of it. However, um, in the interest of public disclosure, we will, of course, post it on our website later this week. Um, in terms of general counsel items, I think we kind of covered a lot of that in the beginning, but um, I will be looking at uh, what is necessary for a new public agency and coming back to you um, with recommendations in terms of adopting bylaws, conflicts of interest codes, uh, filings with the Secretary of State, and then I'll be taking um, a good look through the DCA formation agreement to look at what requirements um, we, we, are, we are obligated to do on signing and then once the JEPA becomes effective, looking at sort of what are we required to do when working with the exec interim exec executive director to map out what we need to do in the next several months legally um, by signing those agreements. And I just wanted to note and very, um, pleased to serve you in this interim role and I look forward to working with you and I also think it's important acknowledgement that uh, DWR is our partner in this so uh, Mr. Gary Lipner was appointed uh, uh, by Carla Namath or named by Carla Namath DWR director as the Delta um, conveyance office head and he's here today so I don't know if Gary wants to stand but right. so you'll probably all be working with him a lot you'll see his face Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Would you like to say something? Back there. I think he just walked out. I scared him. I have a question. Right, join him. Who scared him? I have a question for Stephanie. Um, you mentioned a website. Can you tell the public? 
I, what the website address is? I can, and, it's, and it was on the um, announcement that went out and was also on Maven's um, that we forwarded so that it would become public as soon as we posted it. It is www.dcdc. Dot o -R -D -C -D Let me start again, because I don't want to be accused of dcdca.org. Yep. And once we have a signed JEPA agreement, that will also be posted on that website. So you might want to have a few words for us. Oh, poor Gary. Yes. Since we're working together, Gary, I just, come on up. <laughs> Yeah, didn't mean to catch you off guard, but we wanted to welcome you and uh, also uh, you were introduced so that uh, folks know you're going to be our partner. So. Thank you very much and thank you very much, uh, Chairman, for the opportunity. My name is Gary Lipner and I am the Deputy Director of Delta Conveyance uh, with the Department of Water Resources and I absolutely am looking forward to this partnership and moving this project forward. So. Thank you for today, um, and look forward to working more with you and advancing the project. Thank you, Mr. Libner. Okay, are there any, uh, we're at uh, the end of our meeting, uh, are there uh, any future agenda items that the directors wish uh, for staff to, to address? I know we've already raised some, so I think those are already uh, in the process, but are there any other issues that any of the directors might want to raise at this point? So basically put out something for, should we have another meeting in between and, and then also get that uh, PowerPoint to us? Yes. And a few of the questions that, that uh, we asked the executive director. And uh, anything else? Okay, that, that's, uh, that's gonna be a lot anyway. So. Okay, well, uh, thank all of you for uh, joining us today, uh, and when we're ready to adjourn, we'll see you at the next meeting, and whether it's a special one or not, we stand adjourned then. All right. <laughs>